Our first speaker in the afternoon is David Marsh uh, from King's College London, uh, Milli Electron Volt Terahertz QCD Excellence. Uh, David, please, 30 minutes. Great, thanks very much. Okay, let me just uh, share the screen and I will get started. Um, so f first of all, I want to say uh, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to be here, um, uh, particularly Igor. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm sad, it's, it's a shame I can't be there with you in, in, in Russia, um, but you know, in the, maybe in the future, I hope. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about the, the MEV uh, or terahertz uh, QCD axion and why it's, I, I think, it's a very ripe area for exploration um, in axion parameter space. Okay, so first of all, just a little bit of motivation, and I, I, you'll all be aware of this, but I think it's nice to point out. So um, axions versus WIMPs. They're obviously two historical dark matter theories, each proposed in the you know, 1970s and, and 1980s. And the experimental landscape of both, however, is very different. So this is your typical experimental landscape uh, for, for, for the WIMP. And you have the WIMP mass in hundreds of GeV versus cross section. And, there's, and the theory, in this case, it's um, some scanning of the MSSM and makes a quite a tight prediction, predictive theory. And also experiments have been very good in excluding the predictions of the theory. So these are some exclusions from you know, xenon one term super CDMS and the regions above the line are excluded. So experiments have done great work in ruling out um, WIMP, WIMP models. And WIMP models were also very predictive and gave a, you know, a pretty narrow prediction uh, for, where, for where you should be in this plane of mass versus cross section. Now, if you contrast that to the axion, um, here's an equivalent plot, axion mass again along the um, x-axis, but the coupling strength now um, rather than cross section on the y-axis. And in this case, the, the theory, the theory of the QCD axion makes a prediction that's a line rather than you know, a finite, a finite region. And furthermore, the experiments have not excluded very large portions of this parameter space for dark matter. And that's because, as I've explained briefly, these kind of dark matter searches, um, Sakivi halescopes, are resonant and only work in a narrow range of masses. But this is all going to change. And you heard a lot about how this is exciting, particularly in Hamburg from Andreas's talk uh, this morning. Uh, in the next couple of decades, this is going to completely change for Axion. So this is what we think this plot will look like in a few decades time. This is a brilliant uh, set of figures you can get from Kieran O'Hare's website. And here's all predictions for new types of Axion halo scope. Um, and in particular, um, Andreas talked about, about Mad Max and also about Iaxo um, earlier today. So everything's going to change. And hopefully, the, hopefully Axions will look a little bit more um, like the like the WIMP exclusions um, in a few decades. But to do better, to make a kind of finite um, prediction for where for what the theory target is for axions, um, we need to ask what the axion mass is. And it's very interesting to think of it not in terms of electron volts, um, but also go to the frequency. So axions are coherent uh, field and they oscillate at a frequency and the frequency is what determines the experimental constraints. So keep this conversion in mind. Okay, so what is the QCD axion uh, mass? It's bounded from above uh, by the axion nucleon coupling and the duration of the neutrino burst from supernova 1987A. It's bounded from below by galaxy formation considerations. You'll hear about this in, in Jens Niemeyer's talk um, on Thursday. Um, if the axion is lighter than 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, galaxies don't form um, in quite the right way. And maybe this bound is even higher by a few orders of magnitude. In the middle, there is an important constraint for the QCD axion. Um, sorry, but first of all, very light theories are kind of exotic. Um, you would have, need to have fuzzy dark matter, maybe they arise in string theory, but not the QCD axion probably. And then there's an experimental constraint in the middle as well from the spins of black holes from black hole super radiance, which excludes a window around 10 to the minus 11 electron volts. So that tells the QCD axion is in this um, region on the right, the heavier um, region of axion-like particles, 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus two electron volts. So now 
if we, we this is a finite mass range, but we want to do a little bit better and narrow it down, I'm going to tell you how it's a, a milli electron volt. So then we need to think about axion cosmology. And everything is determined for axion cosmology by when spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. So, and this splits axion cosmology into two halves. If spontaneous symmetry breaking happens before or during inflation, then this inflates the initial value of the axion field, theta, shown here, um, to take up the entire causal horizon um, of our universe. And then this initial value, which is some random number, is essentially a free parameter for observational purposes. And then to get the dark matter abundance from this, you have to solve the Klein-Gordon equation in the expanding universe, and you have a free parameter, the, the axion mass, but you also have this, um, this random number as a free parameter. And that means that because you have this initial field, uh, the the um, there are two there are two continuous free parameters, and so the fixing the dark matter density only fixes one of these, and that's why the, that prediction for the axion is basically on a line. In the alternative scenario where spontaneous symmetry breaking happens after inflation, so these are many different uh, values for the initial axion field theta across our universe, shown shown here as the different coloured circles. And then the nonlinear dynamics that happens after that basically serves to average that initial random number. So what happens is that the, the kibble mechanism leads to the formation of topological defects um, in, in, in the early universe. And then the nonlinear decay of these, of, of these defects leads to relic oscillations in the axion field that compose the cosmic dark matter. The advantage here is that although this is a very nonlinear process and hard to solve exactly, it removes this, this continuous parameter, the random value of theta. So in principle, there is now just a single free parameter, the axion mass, which can be fixed by demanding that we get the right dark matter density. So the model becomes predictive and should give us a narrow region in which to search experimentally. So why does this maybe give milli electron volts. So I'm going to give a bit of a preview of a paper um, that I've worked on with a master's student, Jana Rees, and a postdoc, uh, Seb Hoof. So what we did is we decided to take a statistical view of the best available simulations, and, and, and we only were able to use the ones that gave us the right statistical information, and tried to use this to predict the axial mass. So here's an idea of what we did. We looked at two simulations that provided the right information, um, which were the Kawasaki simulations and the Gorgetto ones. And we broke up the evolution of the, of the axon field into these different regimes, when spontaneous symmetry breaking happens, when oscillations of the axon field begin, when string decay happens, when string decay ends, and when the field evolution becomes fully linear. And we modeled each of these regions by fitting the effect, um, the results of the simulations of Kawasaki and Gorgetto and compared them. So we fit the simulation results and, we, and by using the published error bars, we constructed the covariance matrix for the various quantities that we had to fit. And that allows us to marginalize away the nuisance parameters in the fit. And we also accounted for um, nuisance parameters from the standard model related to, for example, um, the strong coupling constant, the quark masses, and things like that, and propagated all of these uncertainties. The main thing that you need to fit is the instantaneous emission spectrum of the strings. And this was what um, Gorgetto and co used, but this information is also available for the Kawasaki simulations. And for, in both of these cases, the best fit spe spectrum extrapolated to the physical scale um, is what's called IR dominated. Um, if you know this field, it has a, a spectral index Q greater than one. And furthermore, Gorgetto's simulations show a log scaling violation of the string density parameter, um, which is shown here. And again, the, the log um, is the ratio of the Petrichrin radial mode mass to the Hubble scale. And it's basically a measure of how resolved your simulation is. The, with the physical um, scale separation being log of eight, log of 70. And so you see that, that this is a, a simulation that requires extrapolation. 
But okay, after doing that and accounting for all of the uncertainties, we add all the dark matter contributions together, and this gives us a lower bound on the axion mass. By also including a model for the production of hot axion dark matter, and I'd actually point out that recently this has been called into question, uh, but we take it at face value, that gives us also an upper bound on the axion mass and, um, from production of, of dark radiation, effective neutrinos, and we fit this to the Planck results. So we use the Planck results in, in this form. We treat the, the Planck parameter posteriors as a likelihood. So we have the dark matter density and the effective number of relativistic species. So the density in hot axions in this case. And we treat these as a likelihood and sample our parameters um, in a Monte Carlo uh, model. And when you do this, if you demand that the axion is all of the dark matter, it fixes the mass very precisely, even accounting for the uncertainties in the fit and the uncertainties in the standard model parameters. And in this case, it gives a sharp prediction for the mass of around the milli electron volt. And it's quite different to some of the other um, predictions that are in the literature. For example, um, Claire and Moore, uh, also the work of uh, Ben Safdie's group, um, Josh Foster and company, uh, because those works have a UV, spect a UV dominated spectrum for the strings, this leads to a much lower axion mass. We weren't able to do our treatment on, an, on any simulations with UV spectra, simply because they, they hadn't published the, the, the spectra in, in the form that we could, that we could use them. Um, but in any case, Gorgato's simulations and Kawasaki's seem to point to this large milli electron volt axion mass. So now I'm about halfway through my talk and, and we have to ask what's the phenomenology of a milli electron volt axion. And I'm going to tell you about, about two things, one very briefly and, and one in a little bit more detail. So very briefly, I'm going to mention mini clusters um, and I encourage you to see David Ellis, my PhD students, talk um, about this on, on Thursday. Um, I'm only going to really flash a couple of things about this. So, so mini clusters, and also uh, Javi Redondo will be talking about this as well. So mini clusters, as um, I'm sure many of many of you know, and, and, and Igor has done seminal work on this for, for, for many decades, are large overdensities in the axion field caused by the, um, in the caused by the decay of the strings. And the typical mini cluster mass you can you can estimate, and for some reference axion mass scale is around 10 to minus 13 uh, solar masses. The important things to ask are how does structure form from mini clusters? What is their mass spectrum? What is their density profile? And the question I want to ask is what's their phenomenology? So microlensing is an interesting thing to think about. And David will talk about um, David will talk about this in some detail. The important thing to know is that um, the viral Frank white profiles uh, don't lens very well. But power law, if the density profile is power law, mini clusters may be lens. Um, but the, the, the question I want to ask about the milli electron volt axion is, is there any way to search for such mini clusters? So here's the constraints on primordial black holes um, from the, this paper by Nikora et al. And in the low mass regime of mini clusters, the traditional microlensing constraints vanish due to wave-like effects. Um, in the amplification and femtolensing, which um, again was talked about by, by, by Igor back in the 90s, these constraints have also been revised. So if, the, if we have a milli electron volt ax, um, mini cluster, a mini electron volt axion, is there anything we can do to search for mini clusters? And even the, uh, another thing that is looked at for mini clusters is radio astronomy. So this is um, some work by um, uh, Thomas Edwards. Um, and company who have looked at um, what happens if a mini cluster collides with a neutron star. In this case, the, uh, the axions convert into photons in the magnetosphere and give rise to a radio transient. And Edwards and co showed that for power law profiles, maybe even for NFW profiles, there is a, a potentially detectable number of, a number of such transients produced uh, that could be detected by the square kilometer array. Now, these, uh, these predictions were done for a, a higher axion mass than milli electron volt. We're done in this lower 25 micro EV or so 
mass range predicted by the UV string spectra. But if the axion is milli electron volt, how does this how does this change the the radio transient signatures? What happens at, at, at high, you know high radio frequencies or sub millimeter or something? This isn't something I know the answer to, and I, but I. I think this is something we should be thinking about um, as a community. What's the astrophysics? What's the phenomenology of, of mini clusters, radio astronomy of axions in milli EV terahertz? I don't have the answer to this. Something I do have the, ans the answer to, and that I want to spend 10 minutes, my last 10 minutes, telling you about is direct detection of milli EV terahertz axions. And this is something I've been working on a lot over the last um, two to three years. So how do you detect axions? Well, you need a, a magnet to cause axion photon conversion to happen by the inverse Primakov process. You need a resonator, a microwave cavity, to enhance that signal. You probably need a fridge so that you can reduce all of your noise backgrounds and you probably need a big amplifier because the signal is still very tiny in order to detect it. So the traditional way to search for um, axions which works in radio is by the, the Sakivi Haloscope. This is a picture of ADMX, which is one such Haloscope. They're microwave cavities. There is a resonance when the axion natural frequency equals the cavity natural frequency, which is fixed by the length scale of the cavity. This gives you a nice large volume um, for, for axion conversion and a detectably large power in kind of gigahertz frequencies. Of course, we don't know the axion mass. And even if it is in a roughly gigahertz frequency, the cavity still needs to be tuned, in this case by moving rods. And this gives you some um, bandwidth for your cavity that you can search over. And the power that you're aiming to detect in a, in a cavity like ADMX is about 10 to the minus 22 watts. And 10 to the minus 22 watts with gigahertz photons can be detected by, for example, Josephson parametric amplifiers. In milliEV and terahertz, this technology doesn't work anymore. And that, for the following reason. So here is the, the power that is output in a, a, like a um, Sakivi haloscope. And it's a function of the local dark matter density, which is fixed by the Milky Way rotation curve. It's a function of G squared over M, where G is the axion photon coupling and M is the mass. And that's predicted for the QCD axion once you tell me the mass up to an order one constant. And then you have the experimental parameters, so the magnetic field, the quality factor of the resonance and the effective volume in which I'm absorbing uh, form factors for modes and things like that. If you take a terahertz cavity, then this power is just tiny. And that's essentially because the, the effective volume scales like the free, scale, um, scales like one over the frequency cubed. So going up to high frequency makes the volume very small. So for a terahertz cavity, the power is 10 to the minus 29 watts, which is very hard to detect. And to tune such a cavity, you would have to move those imaginary rods on a kind of nanometer scale. So it says KV Haloscope does not work in, in terahertz. Using magnetic resonance overcomes both of the, these problems. If you have a magnetic resonance, then the frequency is no longer connected to the volume. So you can have a larger volume for dark matter conversion. You also no longer need to tune with a mechanical tuning delta L. You need to tune with a, with a, frequent, with a magnetic field and you know, with something like an MRI magnet, you can control that magnetic field at a micro Tesla um, sensitivity. And the idea that I'm going to tell you about utilizing material science to make this work to detect the axion via its photon coupling in terahertz. And the magic is down here. So antiferromagnetic resonance sets the terahertz frequency. It's a typical energy scale of what the so-called anisotropy field and antiferromagnetic resonance. And then if this occurs also in something called a topological insulator, the antiferromagnetic magnons are excited by the axion photon coupling 
in this case. I won't have time to explain this, this in, in any detail in this talk, although I'm happy to answer questions about it at the end. But here's, so here's the idea. Use axion quasi-particles to detect axion dark matter. And this comes from um, the, a paper that I came across from Nature Physics that proposed the existence of dynamical axion field, axion quasi-particle, in topological insulators. This occurs in uh, hypothetical materials, um, such as iron duct bismuth selenide and manganese bismuth telluride. Um, these materials have been hypothesized to contain this phase, but it, the phase has not yet been observed. And in fact, this material manganese bismuth telluride has not even been fabricated successfully yet. But if such a material exists, then the longitudinal magnon in this material has the right properties to couple to the uh, axion term E dot B, forming a quasi-particle with the electric field, which gives the photon an effective mass in a way that I will explain. So the key idea uh, that I'm telling you about now is to use axion quasi-particles, longitudinal magnons, to detect axion dark matter. I don't have time to tell you about the details of it, but I'm going to try and give you some of the idea about it. So here's the, here's the coupled perturbation equations that arise in that material. So where big delta theta is the axion quasi-particle. Axion dark matter drives the system at a frequency given by the axion mass. This is the driving term here. And this is from the axion photon coupling. It drives the electric field in the presence of an applied magnetic field. The E dot B coupling in the material between the electric field and the axion quasi-particle gives a mixing between E and delta theta. And, it, th and this leads to an effective photon mass. And that's the whole, that's, ev that's everything that you need to know about driving, the, about driving the resonance. So if you diagonalize the left-hand side of this equation, you end up with two, um, two, two massive modes called polaritons, which are mixtures of the electric field and the axion quasi-particle. And they have frequencies omega plus minus here, which are determined by the mass of the axion quasi-particle which comes from antiferromagnetic resonance and it's in the milli electron volt range. And then this parameter B, which arises from the mixing between the axion quasi particle and the electric field, and it's determined by the axion quasi particle decay constant, and also by the applied magnetic field. So for typical values of this decay constant in the kind of tens of EV range, you have a tuning of the resonant frequency of the polaritons by changing your magnetic field. How does this give rise to production of something you can measure? So this polariton resonance means that the material acts like having an effective refractive index less than one, which means that the photons have an effectively longer wavelength inside the material. Uh, this was done by uh, Jan Schuter Engel, um, Andreas's PhD student. He worked this out. And then if you solve the electromagnetic boundary conditions for such a material with such an effective refractive index, it acts like a, like a reflecting um, cavity. And there's a mismatch between the induced electric field. So I'm showing here the axion dark matter induced electric field in blue. The mismatch between the electric field inside the material and outside causes by the boundary conditions means that you have to produce emitted waves and you have constructive interference um, of the reflected waves inside the material, and it acts like a kind of fabry perot cavity, leading to a boost factor for the signal, in exact analogy to a dielectric haloscope like Mad Max. So now the power is given by some reference electric field value, the axion induced electric field in vacuum, the surface area of this emitting surface, and a boost factor beta squared that can be computed um, and is and determined by this effective refractive index, just like the fabry perot boost factor. So you can kind of view this idea in a schematic way like this. It looks like a resonant dish antenna. Andreas told you about, um, about dish antennas, and they work by collecting axions on a big area, by collecting induced photons on a big area and focusing them onto a detector. But if you have, but here, by using a resonance, you can do this for much smaller effective areas. So you could have a, an area of this material of 20 centimeters squared and get a detectable signature. 
Now I'm running out of time, so um, I'm just going to tell you very quickly about the possible pitfalls of this um, search strategy. The first one is the dielectric losses in the material. These are the hypothetical materials, so I don't have numbers for you for what the dielectric function of, the, of, of them is, but I can estimate it for some related materials. Even then, this material, bismuth selenide, has only been measured, has its dielectric function measured in optical. So terahertz spectroscopy is really needed on these materials to know um, the answers, but it doesn't look too bad. You might be able to get some kind of a of a loss factor corresponding to a quality factor of say 10 cubed for your resonance. Similarly, another source of loss is uh, scattering of the magnons with themselves and with uh, impurities in the crystal. Again, the data isn't there for the materials, but I looked up some related materials and did some order of magnitude estimates and you might be able to get a quality factor of 10 cubed for the resonance. And that's really the deciding factor. If these materials exist, they need and you, the resonance has to be of a good quality to work as an axion detector. And 10 cubed seems to work and seems reasonable to me, but very unknown. Once you include losses, you can then go ahead and compute the compute the compute the boost factor, and it depends on the thickness of the material. We seem to be able to get good boost factors of 100 to 1,000 for material thicknesses of around a millimeter with realistic losses. If all of that comes together, here's how you could do to search for to search for terahertz axions with this with this idea. So here I'm showing forecasts for such a search, assuming a surface area of disk. Uh, 20 centimeters squared, a thickness of disk, two millimeters, and a total scan time of three years. The different lines correspond to different assumptions for the losses measured in milli electron volts, which is basically the inverse quality factor um, here, and different dark count times um, for the proposed detector going from 10 to the minus three, which is relatively conservative in terahertz these days, um, I think, and possibly up to um, an inverse day, which is something that has been talked about for um, for for dish antennas searching for axions in this frequency range. So I'll just leave you now with my with my sum with my summary, which is that post-inflation spontaneous symmetry breaking predicts an axial mass around a milli EV if the string spectrum is IR dominated. I think. It's a problem we should all be considering is what is the phenomenology of very low mass mini clusters? Will mini clusters femtolens? And what is what is their high frequency radio astronomy um, signature? For haloscope technology, milli EV terahertz is a gap in, in that technology. And maybe we can use axion um, quasi particle materials to fill that gap. So that's all I wanted to tell you. Uh, thanks very much, and I'll take some questions. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, I see the question from Jim uh, Levkov, please. Uh, good day. Uh, thank you very much, David, for, for, the, for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, two questions, actually. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned that there are two, two, two types of simulations. One of them gives uh, infrared uh, dominated spectrum of axions and another one is UV dominated, right? Yeah. So uh, you, you studied <laughs> kind of uh, the, both of them, the literature, and uh, can you say w what kind of simulations seems more preferable to you and on what basis? Um, okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. I don't. I, I didn't do any of the simulations, um, and I don't. I, I don't really want to say you know what. I don't want to make anyone angry by saying that I think one, um, a, any one is better than another. However, what what I think about the, the one of the reasons we use the Gorgetto simulations uh, to make our estimates is that they try to make the extrapolation um, from the. Uh, log seven to the physical log in a controlled um, 
in a controlled way. Uh, although it should be said that crossing to the IR dominated spectrum is not yet observed in the simulation. So it could be that, that the log behavior goes away and you never cross. Um, but but I, think we, I think we can answer the question. Now, let me say it the other way. How, how will we know who's right? I think we can know by pursuing the method that Gorgetto um, and company showed and pushing the logs to further values. Um, and and you know, we, I, I know people are looking at uh, you know your computational computational tricks to try and do this. And if you can push the log by a by a couple from say log seven to to, to log eight, maybe even log log nine, you might see that crossover to IR. So yeah, so, sorry, I'm not saying which I think is better, but I think if you pursue Gorgetto's methods to make the extrapolation in a controlled way and go a little bit further we should see the transition to IR. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, and the second question is that uh, you you find, uh, yeah, so y you have your um, condensed matter kind of uh, perturbations, axions, like condensed matter axions, which also mix with uh, the usual axion, uh, like photons. So uh, is, it, uh, um, uh, is this uh, solid state uh, physics better for generating axions like in light shining through wall experiment? Okay, so um, let me just go back to the equations of motion a minute because it might help us think about it. So, so the um, axion quasi particle mixes strongly with the electric field uh, because it's got a relatively uh, small decay constant, 64 electron volts. So this is a strong mixing, and that's why it forms this polariton. Whereas the axion dark matter in this, in, in the case that um, I'm looking at, is, a, is at a perturbative effect. Um, so the dark matter isn't really mixing with the axion quasi particle, but it's a, it's a perturbation. Now, um, you could do lots of analog axion experiments, so like light shining through a wall, with the axion quasi particles. Um, so, so it's actually a th the original paper by Wiltcheck on this um, in '87 talked about axion analog experiments you could do with such a material. No, no I mean to, I mean to generate the actual axion to, to create actual beam of actual axions using these quasi particles. Mm -hmm. Do they help help to to create axions? I haven't um, I haven't thought about that. I think it's I think it's a very good question as to whether these materials could be used for other aspects of axion physics because, um, well, what you're effectively doing is giving the giving the photon a mass, um, and if that could be helpful to you, then yes. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot to I think there's a lot to be explored with these materials about whether they could help us, but I I haven't thought about that question particularly. Thank, thank you. It's a very good question. And Andreas, your question. So thank you very much for, for your very nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the, so, so you, you considered, you considered uh, for the post-inflationary scenario, always the domain one number equal to one case. So which, uh, which is the case where you have a, a, a short lived domain wall, so to say. But mm -hmm. there, there could be the case that you have domain one number larger than one. Yeah. And then, uh, then of course you need some, you have to take into account some, some effects, patching wind symmetry breaking effects such that you really, uh, that, that, that the domain walls are not living forever. They should, be long, they should be long lived, but there could be other consequences for the mini clusters, for example, and, mm -hmm. and also maybe your, your, uh, your preferred dark matter range will move from one milli electron volt to 10 milli electron volt or yeah. so. so uh, right, yeah. So, um... So I think, yeah, n greater than one is something that um, hasn't been studied in that many uh, simulations, as, as I'm sure you know. Uh, mm. The best simulations of it, to my knowledge, is still the ones from yeah. about 2012 by Hiramatsu and company. Mm -hmm. um, and if you remember in their, in, in their paper, they, they, if you demand that the fine tuning that you induce, so, so you have to introduce this bias, so it's the main walls yeah, decay, yeah, yeah. the fine tuning from that, um, on the induced neutron electric dipole moment is taken to be minimal, then you get forced up against the um, against the supernova constraints. 
Okay. Uh -huh. um, and you get forced to basically the highest mass um, you could have. So, so here, uh, this is the Gorgetto uh, minimum mass prediction of a, of a few 0.5 milliEV. Uh, here's the supernova 1987A bound. And if you demand minimal fine tuning, domain wall number greater than one forces you up against here. Okay. Now, in terms of mini, so, so for the direct detection, it pushes you to about 10, tw 10 mm -hmm. to 20 milliEV. Mm -hmm. For mini clusters, um, it's actually something I, I had a bachelor's student looked at. Um, mm -hmm. And the mini cluster mass gets much larger because, mm -hmm. okay, what's the mini cluster mass set by, set by the mass in the horizon when the, uh, when the field decays? Mm -hmm. the, the mass over which there are like order one density perturbations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because with domain walls, you delay the domain wall decay. Uh, yeah. The domain walls decay later than the strings. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore the mass of the, uh, of, of the mini cluster is much larger. So, there, so, so that, and that's kind of nice, because if you, if you remember by constraints, I mean like constraints of primordial black holes are much easier at higher masses. Yeah, yeah. But are these mini clusters produced from domain wall number greater than one dense? And that, I don't know. Um, oh. And I, th I think we, we, like, we need simulations um, of it, but the, the simulation task will be even harder than with strings. So, mm -hmm. okay. um, so yeah, you pu get pushed to higher axion mass with domain wall number greater than one, um, but actually higher mini cluster masses, but probably lower mini cluster densities. So uh, that's up in the air, I think. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question by Igor, please. Yeah, David, um, very nice talk as usual. Thank you. Uh, so you have in your model, you have ultra light mini clusters and you suggest to look for axions using dish antenna. And this is set up which, um, yeah, it depends uh, what, what is the quality factor you choose, but maybe you can go to a little bit less sensitivity and to search for uh, <clears throat> tidal debris from mini clusters. In your setup, it might be both, both dish antenna and um, ultralight mini clusters kind of pushing to, to, to these kind of efforts, no? Have you thought about it? Yeah, so, um, okay, yeah, so, so with the ultralight mini, with, with, okay, yeah, if you've got mini clusters, you have to worry about what the local dark matter density is. Um, and as, as, as you write, as you rightfully say, um, a, lo a lot of that will be in tidal streams if yeah. the mini clusters are getting tidally disruptive. Um, how much they get tidally disrupted depends quite sensitively on their, on their density profile. Um, so yeah, I have actually these slides in my backup slides. Uh, this is a paper I'm, I'm sure you've seen by Kavanagh um, and, and company who looked at tidal disruption of mini clusters with different density profiles. So they looked at NFW type profiles and power law type profiles. And if you're more NFW like, the, the, the stripping works quite well. So then you maybe have a 50 50 balance between a smooth component and like um, and, and rare streams, whereas for power law it's, it's less so. Um, and then, and then you, and then you asked, have I thought about detecting tidal streams in this kind of resonant dish antenna type thing? And the answer is no, I haven't thought about what that would do to the detection sensitivity. We only assume a smooth component at the standard, you know, 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed for this forecast. Um, I think it would be, I mean, I, I think we should all, I mean, I, I should, we should, everyone should think about what are the real forecast sensitivities when you expect there to be. Yeah, it would uh, be very interesting. When you expect there to be mini clusters. So yeah, it is a bit of a cheat really. I've shown a forecast sensitivity ignoring mini clusters and I talked about mini clusters for ages at the beginning. Um, I would like to do much better with that. And yeah, I think it's a great, great question. Um, I think it's something Again, I'm kind of point, trying to point things out here that are challenges, and that's definitely one to consider. Thank you. Uh, David, we, we have a, uh, two questions from Dr. Kalpana Bora in the chat. Uh, can you see them, or I will read? Um, I will read could you read them? Can the axion couple with standard model fermions and Higgs? And the second, 
Are accidents in any particular mass range are more favorable to be detected experimentally or favorable theoretically? Okay, so um, accidents coupling to uh, the Higgs, uh, they d um, there isn't, uh, well, the radial mode couples to the Higgs and Andreas's uh, smash uh, model, but for this, um, for axion to Higgs, that happens in the, so there's two types of axion model. There's the uh, Kim, Schiffman, Weinstein, Zakharov, uh, KSVZ, and Dime, Fischler, Shrednicki, Zitnitsky, DFSZ. In the DFSZ one, the axion primarily couples to the standard model via mixing uh, with the Higgs. Um, but in the KSVZ one, it doesn't. Standard model fermions, uh, yes, the axion uh, couples to them. This, this coupling here, um, axion photon coupling is generated by a, by a triangle diagram of axion to fermions that are charged under, SG, um, under U1 electromagnetism. For the direct axion fermion coupling, not through the loop, there are a number of experiments that are looking for this. Um, for example, Casper via nuclear um, magnetic resonance, quacks via electron spin resonance, um, and Ariadne via the induced forces. If you couple to a standard model fermion, the action induces a, a spin-dependent force between those fermions. So yes, definitely um, does couple to fermions um, and the Higgs, but it's a model-dependent question. And then for the mass range, um, the, easier mass, the easiest mass range to search for, the easiest one is the one where all these experiments are here um, at gigahertz. Uh, roughly frequency and masses of around the micro EV. And that's technologically fixed by the size of the cavity, like I talked about. Um, the, and, but there are ideas, like I showed on uh, slide two, to search in most of the range that now. For the theoretically preferred mass range, um, at the moment, my favorite is milli electron volt. Um, but I'm kind of, bi but I'm, I'm biased because I have this nice idea that works there. Um, so, but, but, but I think like the whole mass range is, is pretty much open. And there's these two theoretical scenarios, right? For the, for the symmetry breaking. If the symmetry breaking happens before or during inflation, the whole mass range I think is, um, is open. Um, it's only in this like uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking after inflation where you even can, I think, talk about a favored mass range. So I hope that answers the question. So it was a quite a long answer. Thank you, David. Uh, we we have no more questions. Thank you for a nice uh, talk. In, in, thank you very much. Inquiring talk. Let's thank the speaker.